Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a bit of a dry topic, documents, but in fact it's absolutely uh, critical. I don't think I exaggerate by calling it a critical issue. At the end of the day, bringing any claim litigating small, fast or multi-track cases, it's all about good preparation. And having your paperwork in apple pie order is, you know, it's really essential, particularly if it goes all the way to trial. Now, I'm going to just cover off a number of different sections really in relation to this issue of documentation. And I have a case that's just sort of hot off the press. They've just sent the documents to hit a 4 p.m. deadline this evening. And they've kindly allowed me to talk to you about their particular case, give the facts, in order to put some, you know, some real sort of reality into these otherwise dry sort of technical theoretical legal vlogs. Now the case is a classic case too, it's a builder who's brought a, a claim against a customer client who has simply said I don't like, I'm not happy with the works, I think you've messed up, your workmen were dreadful, they caused damage, the whole thing's been an absolute uh, dog's dinner and I'm not paying your invoices of nine odd grand. So it's a small claim, obviously, uh, and because I was forced out of my house uh, and I had to stay in a hotel, I'm bringing a counterclaim. So there's a, not only is there a defence to the nine grand, approximately nine grand claim of the invoices, there is also a, a, a counterclaim. So, it's, you know, it's a slightly complicated case, but simple in many ways, because factually it's a classic, you know, building works type dispute. Now, uh, the first thing to say is that, uh, you know, you can save money in legal fees by collating your documents carefully. What do I mean by collating? It's a word I've never, re never really fully understood until quite recently. And it means organizing your documents, organizing your paperwork. So in this uh, particular case, collating documents meant not doing this, which is basically sending me like five or six different emails with photographs of every individual page of every different document and then attaching it to the email as a JPEG, yeah? This is how long it takes for me to print out a JPEG on that little printer there. And that this whole exercise of actually uh, my clients won't uh, be best pleased with me, but the fact of the life is they're presented the, the papers of their case to me in a very chaotic way. Uh, not only were there five different emails, and not only were there dozens of JPEG photographs attached to each individual email, um, but they were also in a mess chronologically. So I had to, as you see here, start to organise the papers into different sections. Now learn from the lesson of this particular client, this has added 150 quid nearly to the bill. Uh, I've paid them three hours work, 450 pounds plus fat, takes it to 540. Uh, it's, you know, it's a reasonably high value claim. It's definitely, definitely worth while getting a little bit of legal input at this stage of proceedings because they've just been faced with this uh, counter claim and they now have got to file directions questionnaires that the court have sent out as well as file and serve their own uh, defence and reply to this guy's counterclaim. He's, you know, decided he's going to fight. So, uh, so that's the first thing you can save um, at least an hour of my legal fees in uh, getting your paperwork in apple pie order. It's also relevant because, as you can see, there there are different categories of uh, documentation, and when it if and when it comes to trial, you're going to want to need to have your paperwork in a, you know in a perhaps in a folder with dividers and you want you'll want to have your paperwork put into different categories now uh, they're called for big cases where lawyers are instructed and the track is a cost-bearing one uh, i.e lawyers get paid then uh, and not small claims we have jury bundles and they could be you know leave big lever arch files and they're all divided into different categories. So what are those categories? Well, I'll list them up here. 
I mean, the primary ones it will vary. Different cases will have, you know, different emphasis on different parts of elements of the claim. But classically, will be firstly the the pleadings, the actual documents which lay out the story and the defence to the claim and, and uh, reply to the defence. And if there's a counterclaim, the defence, the counterclaim as well. So here they, I mean, here they are. I'll put. But that's a classic uh, N1 claim form there, um, and so you put you, know, you put all of those together in a section, and then you may have uh, invoices. A, a classic. Sorry, that's not the invoices there. You may have invoices, um, and in that case, you know, there's a bundle of invoices there. That's obviously a fundamental issue, particularly when it comes to quantifying the value of your claim. It's really critical to know exactly the amount of money that you're claiming so that you fill in the paperwork properly. Um, then there will be evidence. That's not something that um, you inter gets introduced into later on in the proceedings, really, when you start exchanging witness statements. Um, here's a bundle here. So that's, that's an evidence. So, you see how you can put things into different different categories. Also, I like a category which is just court correspondence. It's really important to read court letters, court orders, uh, in, and because there's lots of detail in them. If you get it wrong, you, you may end up on the, the wrong end of a cost order or worse. So there you've got different uh, sort of sections, different categories of, the, of, of, the, of paperwork. So if you start to be thinking along the, li the lines of categorizing your paperwork documentation, now it'll make you so much more comfortable when you go into a courtroom with a judge who's a bit testy, who hasn't had his breakfast, who is uh, grumpy, it's, it's, it's a cold Monday morning, and is in a hurry cause to get through a long list of, you know, a dozen bloody cases. And, and he does not want to hang around, okay? Bit, courts are very busy and somewhat underfunded these days. Okay, so uh, that's why it's really critical. The next thing I'm going to come on to is actually presenting the pleadings themselves. Now, in this case, you've got quite a lot of pleadings, i.e. the claim, what, the defence, the reply, the counterclaim, the defence to counterclaim, whatever's necessary. Here, um, my client's presented a good, although it's invariably too long. I mean, Claims always always are too long because people put evidence in them rather than just tell the bare skeleton story. Uh, so, but it's still a good, well prepared document actually. But they've put without prejudice on top, which is going to confuse the judge and the court. By the way, another category worth listing um, is offers. Without prejudice is only something you ever see on uh, on an offer. Okay, now, without prejudice means I'm making an offer to you of money. They might choose to make an offer here, lower than the claim amount, label it without prejudice, so that then if it comes to trial, if that offer is rejected, it comes to trial, it can't be produced as evidence by the other side and used against you. All right? The, the judge only looks at without prejudice correspondence after he's decided who's won and who's lost. All right? So that could, could be confusing. A judge look at that and go, oh, what's that? Without prejudice, it's an offer. What? What is it? Well, it's actually the particulars of claim. They've made, they've made the same mistake in the case of defence and the reply, uh, the reply and the defence to the counterclaim. Uh, and here you see, uh, and this is exactly this is what happened in this particular case. Here you see. Uh, a, this is what we redrafted. I just been knocked up a basic template for them, and uh, you know, this is something that we regularly use. And uh, basically, put both the particulars of claim and the reply into what, what's the just a traditional way of formatting pleadings. Okay, it's got the court name, court number, the name of the claimant, the defendant, and it's always good to number. Whilst these, you know, I, I think quite well prepared documents, they're not paginated and it's not numerated if that's if that's a word so you, you, you if you're in court and you're saying well your honor can I refer you to um, one two three four five yeah you get the idea 
So pagination is good, but best of all is to actually number your individual paragraphs. Be prepared for court, okay? You've got to be tough. It's an entrepreneurial endeavor. You've got to be prepared to sit all the way through. That's, that's your best chance of getting early settlement. Right, so um, I will just now deal with uh, issues and how to, uh, I'm gonna just briefly touch on this, but really it, it's an issue for another whole vlog. But here is the, uh, the defense in this case, the defense and the counterclaim. Uh, all that he's done is he's filled in the box here. He hasn't, it's gone over, over leaf, um, and he hasn't uh, created a separate document like the claimant, like my client, has a sole separate document, which incidentally should be attached to the claim form when you first file the claim. They forgot to, well, they didn't realize they had to, they had to if, if the box is on the claim form aren't big enough, you know, then you need to do a, a separate particulars of claim and sit and say see attached in the form and then, you know, staple it to the claim form and send it off. You might also include invoices to this, but you, you could just describe the invoices rather than actually include a whole extra bundle. Probably better to keep it simple and just, just itemize the invoices rather than actually attaching them. You don't really want to be attaching too much to the claim form. Probably just that really in most cases maybe a contract if it's you know if, if it's an issue that's very sensitive um, so that's what you do with uh, the sorry we were talking about issues beg your pardon so now the question arises this is one of those cases where the defendant's kicking off and he's saying well not only have you made a mess of the works but you've caused me collateral damage so I'm bringing a counterclaim the claimant here was very keen, obviously, and uh, to and I think there's some real merit in the claim. And the, d the defence does look a little bit like he's blustering uh, and just being a little bit intransigent, perhaps because he didn't like the uh, the type of renovation that was done. I mean, who knows what the reason was? It's not relevant, but for this vlog, so. Um, now the, th the thing to do when you're then, then drafting your defence, you're replying your defence to, hi to, uh, to his counterclaim and, and his defence, you're replying to his defence and then you're defending his counterclaim, you're the claimant, um, is that the key thing is to, to go through what he says in his defence, be quite cool and neutral to take out the issues keyword issues and you know by all means put them into headings above each of your paragraphs where you say and I will give you an example here uh, one of the allegations he makes in the d in his uh, defense and counterclaim is that the builders were disorganized they caused damage there were delays okay um, you want to have a little you know, it's saying alleged delays and damage in bold and underneath your numerated paragraph dealing with what he says in his defense and counterclaim. There was no damage, in fact, it was never raised by the claimant throughout the time of the, 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 uh, the client, throughout the time of the works. In fact, it was, he told some of our builders that the job was excellent and in fact he wanted them to quote for other business. You know, so you just knock his point into touch and giving yourself a heading, there might be five, six, seven, eight different uh, angles depending upon the defense and the counterclaim. Giving yourself a heading helps you to focus on, you know, knocking it, his points into touch. And I will just um, touch on uh, the issue of evidence here. It is um, not appropriate to be including evidence in your paperwork at this stage. As I say, the stage in this case is the court has ordered that the parties have got to file directions questionnaires, which is, you know, helps the court to manage the case, size, number of witnesses, trial length, that sort of thing. That's what directions questionnaires are for. Is there an expert required? Um, uh, but also in this particular case, as I say, because there's a defence and, and, a, and a particularly a counterclaim, 
um, the claimant, my client, was tempted to, you know, produce a whole load of emails by way of evidence and, and file them along with his uh, defence, uh, his reply, sorry, and defence to the counterclaim, his response, in other words, to the defendant's defence and counterclaim. And here's quite a long bundle. So this was all sent to me by JPEG. And as you can see, it's, um, can you see that? Quite a large document. Don't send it at this stage. This is evidence. The place for evidence is as exhibits to witness statements. And the court will make an order closer to trial, still some way from trial, in which it will give the parties a certain number of days to choose a day when there will be simultaneous exchange of witness statements, evidence and any other documents that are relevant. So, um, yeah, say keep your powder dry. Don't be sending your evidence to anybody at this stage. Um, now, just to give you a little illustration here of what I was saying about the evidential issues in this case, here is a, um, I'll keep my finger over the name, he's marked, quite rightly, this is good preparation for when he does come to produce a witness statement, he's marked, quite, uh, he's marked in high lit a sentence in which, in this case, the client has said in an email that this particular chap, a Tyler, whose name shall go unnamed, is doing an excellent job, he specifically talked up the works. So obviously, is eager to put that in now, but don't wait, include it with witness statement. For the pleading stage of things, all you're doing is you're saying, I disagree, the works were, uh, you know, I disagree with the allegation that the, <coughs> that uh, we caused any damage. Um, in fact, uh, it was told to us by the defendant that we were doing an excellent job. Then when it comes to the witness statement, you can say, and here is the evidence to prove that. Okay, so uh, that there it is. Just have a quick look at my notes. Yeah, the next thing is the courts. How do you deal with you know paperwork and the courts? Well, uh, it's, it's quite an interesting ex sort of example. This one because of the the way the claim is being bounced about, bounced around the courts. Here, here is a what's called a notice of transfer of proceedings. You know, this is why you should sort of keep your court paperwork separate because you don't want to be sending your paperwork to the wrong court. <laughs> yeah. And now this is said to be in the county court business centre, um, but in fact it's now being transferred to the Royal Courts of Justice Thomas More Building on the Strand. So that is where the directions questionnaires and the reply in the defence to counterclaim should be sent. So in the directions questionnaire, the claim specified the court that they want, which is in North London, the local court in North London, but nevertheless had to return, has to return the paperwork, uh, you know, basically as the court in this case has ordered to the, to the Strand. It will then, a decision will be then be made whether to agree to the recommendation to transfer it to the claim of the defendant's local county court. They both live in the same area in this instance. Be careful if, the, if you're a business and defendant's an individual, they can elect to have the case moved to a court nearer them. So uh, there it is. Um, yeah, and, and just on, you know, should you file documents electronically or should you uh, put things in the post? Uh, as lawyers, we are now filing things electronically, okay? Um, but we're, we're familiar with the correct email addresses to use. Um, we're familiar with the restrictions about PDFs and the quantity of them and what detail needs to go into the subject box. If you're a geek and you love the law and you want to read up the CPR, and you know, then fine, it's easier, isn't it? Uh, filing electronically. And indeed, if you're about to miss a 4 p.m. deadline, by all means, file electronically, perhaps post and file electronically so you can prove to the court that you've actually filed before a deadline because it takes a couple of days for the post to arrive. But I'm tending to think that for the from a general advice for most individuals or small businesses who uh, don't 
aren't familiar with the rules and the, and the protocols, to, to use good old fashioned snail mail, put it in the post, perhaps use a special delivery or something like that, certainly get proof of postage. Um, I know there's something, uh, something you know, concrete about using the postal service in legal proceedings. Now also don't forget, you should be, as I've reminded this client, you should be sending everything that you send to the court, that's filing when you send stuff to the court, you should be serving it, that means sending it to your opponent as well. So make sure you've sent everything, you made two copies, you sent, well you've kept, kept a copy for yourself obviously, you've sent a copy to the court and you've sent a copy to your opponent. All right, so I think that concludes uh, today's vlog. Uh, yeah, what, uh, what can I say? Apple pie uh, order is the, the way to uh, approach these issues. Uh, be careful of court orders, read the detailed deadlines, addresses for sending court documents any other little bugbears, it, it's just about reading the documents carefully, not trying to rush it, is critical. And as I say, you will thank me, as, as uh, hopefully my clients, who I hope will be successful with their claim, will thank me, even when it comes to trial, for having got your paperwork and apple pie order, because there's nothing worse than being hurried by a grumpy judge on a Monday morning and trying to ruffle through your paperwork, which is in a state of, in a state of, you know, general disorder. There's nothing worse when you, there's a real critical point or issue that you want to make to the court and it gets overlooked because you ain't got your papers in shape. All right, that's all for now. Um, look forward to blogging you in, blogging to you in the very near future. By the way, I will just say one thing, which is quite interested in any comments that anyone has got about their experiences of the courts, um, what they found as most successful in terms of filing, whether it be by email or by post, and so on and so forth, and, and indeed any other thoughts that you've got as lay people on uh, how the courts treat um, mistakes, errors, incomplete, improperly formatted documents when it comes to uh, the judgment day of trial. All right, goodbye for now.